Hi everyone, there's a lot of people in here and I'm kind of intimidated by all of you. <laughs> but after all of us, we're all going to be friends, so it's all okay. Are we uh, ready to go? Okay. Awesome. So today, obviously I'm talking about monsters. Um, I like monsters because they're cute. They're actually not big and scary. But before we get started, I want to ask you to raise your hand. Um, if you have a website on Joomla, but your business has nothing to do with Joomla. Okay. Um, what about if you build websites on Joomla or do development for other people? A lot more people. All right, excellent. And how many of you build Joomla components and extensions and that sort of thing? Awesome. We have a technical room. I shouldn't have been so scared of, of putting technical stuff in here. Thank you. So today I'm hoping to answer some of the questions that you might have about improving UX of your uh, components and extensions and your websites. Uh, UX stands for user experience. If you didn't already know that, you've probably seen the acronym pop up all over the place and it can be a little intimidating if you don't really know what it means or how to do it and you know you should be thinking about it but you, there's a lot of different information out there. So I'm here to pull the curtain back. Uh, explain to you what that will mean to you for your Joomla businesses and your components and how to do your own research and improve your components so it's easier for people to use, you get less tickets and that sort of thing. Uh, if I've done my job right, you'll, you'll have some ideas when you leave the session. If not, you can yell at me at the end. There's time for questions, I think. Uh, and if there's not, it goes right into the coffee break so you guys can just ask me then. Please hold all of your questions until the end. So, that, my face got really big. Uh, who am I? Why should you listen to me? I think that's an excellent question. I don't really know, but uh, my name is Crystal. I am an American, as you can hear by my accent. Please don't hold it against me. I promise I'm okay. I'm not like the bad ones. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I worked for the largest inbound marketing company in the world as their first and only UX architect. Uh, so I had to bring UX processes into their company. Uh, I helped to restart and uh, led for a brief time the Joomla UX team before uh, moving on from that to build my own company and focus on my own business. And as part of that, I've also provided some consulting for uh, Akiba Backup, that guy over there. Uh, and you, you, you know who he is, as he said in his session, so I won't go into that. So, what is UX? It sounds like a very simple question, it's just three words. But it's actually probably easier to tell you or start with what it's not. UX is not the same thing as UI. User experience and user interface, they're related and they are often used interchangeably, but they're not, it's not the same thing. An interface, broadly speaking, is a point of contact between man and machine, or even two machines, where they are communicating, where information is going to be exchanged. I want to try an experiment with you guys. I want all of you to please pull your phones out. Pull your phones out. This, this, this is an interactive session. <coughs> Take a look at the screen. Don't unlock it, just, just let it show you what the lock screen looks like. Does it show you the time? Do you have any kind of notifications? Uh, does it show you how to unlock it or do you have to interact with it in some way in order to show a number pad? That screen is a prime example of a user interface as a noun. It gives you information in a succinct, visually pleasing way. In turn, you could give it the information that you'd like to unlock your phone or learn more about a no notification or take a picture. Everything on that screen, and hopefully every screen that your phone or your computer will ever show you, has been laid out very carefully by a UI designer. The text, the buttons, notifications, everything has been selected with care. UX involves all of that and a whole lot more. 
Take a look at that screen again. Now unlock your phone. You'll notice I didn't tell you how to do that. You knew, right? Now I know that, that the critics among you are gonna be like, oh Crystal, I do that every day, of course I know how to unlock my phone, whatever. But the first time you use that phone, or if you can think back to the time that you used a smartphone for the first time, did someone show you how to do it or do you, did you decide to just play with it and figure it out for yourself? And how did it make you feel when you figured it out for yourself? That feeling, that reaction, those emotions, that is what UX is about. It's kind of a silly question to ask you, well, how, how did that make you feel? How, how, how is unlocking your phone? Um, right now, since you've done it a million times, it probably doesn't have any kind of strong emotional rea reaction in you. But if it didn't work the way you expected it to, or if it didn't work the first time when you were trying to do it, or if you had to figure out a lot of things or get help, I bet you would have been really, really frustrated. So to basically summarize all of that, the UI, the user interface, is what people use to interact with the product. UX is how that interaction makes them feel or don't feel as it happens. So this is the uh, official definition of user experience that comes from the International Standards Organization. User experience is a person's perceptions and responses resulting from the use or anticipated use of a product, system, or service. That's a mouthful, but notice how it describes the reaction of the users and doesn't say a word about design or making it pretty or things like that. It's all about feelings. People often get confused about that. UX is often used as a noun in conversation or say I do UX or, or can we do some UX on this site and that's I'm, I'm guilty of it too but it's actually incorrect because you don't do it it's not a noun it's a verb it's a reaction to how well your site or your product or whatever it is meets your users needs and every user is different what that means is that you can never 100% control a user's experience. Oops, so why am I standing up here talking to you right now if you can't really do much about it? Well, user experience is the reaction <coughs> of a user or a user's experience. And you can't control that. But there are things that you can do to shape the reaction. And we're going to go over that in a few minutes. Why should you care? No. Let's take a step back. You, you haven't left the room yet, so that's a good sign. You're still listening to me, I think. So hopefully you know that you should care about user experience, or at very least you're at least a little curious about it. So we're making progress. That's good. Mostly, you should care because, well, in addition to being a good person and caring about your user's needs, it has a really good return on investment. You can make really small changes with user experience and have it have a humongous impact. Um, Nicholas over there from Akiba, he could talk about it. Working with him, we've made very small changes in Akiba backup recently. And he said that introducing some of those UX considerations into his product increased his sales of Akiba backup or helped contribute to the increase of about 20% in over the course of a month. And that was with that was with little things like if you use a Kiba and, and you've noticed it, the download ID being able to enter it right from the component or the site transfer wizard, that sort of thing. There are other benefits too. If you have an extension or an app or a site, considering the user's experience will help reduce the number of support tickets that you get because it helps create a frictionless interaction between you and your users. Meaning they don't need to click help and get really frustrated and you get frustrated and then you yell at them and then and nobody's happy. On websites, good UX can increase the number of conversions because it's easier for someone to buy something. It's not really marketing stuff, it's just easier to meet the user's needs. I could go on, um, but if you do a quick Google search on the ROI of UX, 
you will find a lot of studies and a lot of hard data that you can use to uh, make up your mind. But essentially, it lowers the barrier between you and your users, making your goals, your revenue goals, or your, your number of support tickets easier to accomplish, and your users' goals, whatever they're trying to do with your product or your site. So, you know why? Let's start to dig into the meaty stuff. Let's look at how. Crafting a good user experience means strategy. It means you have to have a really good strategy, a foundation. But since no two users are the same, no two sites are the same, fortunately, there's really not much of a universal, OK, do this, that, and everything, and you're good. You've seen a lot of best practices out articles, or I've seen a lot. You've, you may have seen. Uh, articles like that where they list, oh, top 10 UX trends. <sighs> Don't look at that. Um, there's no guarantee that those use cases will fit your own. Just because one technique was acceptable to the users of one company, it doesn't mean that it can relate to yours. You have to do your own research. So how many of you learned about the scientific method in school? I'm hoping a lot of you will raise your hands because that's all right, that's good. Do, do, you end, uh, do you remember the steps, the different bits of it? You can shout it out. This is interactive. I want you to, to listen. Hypothesis. As long as it can't be disproved, it remains true. Mm -hmm. OK, that's good. There's research involved, right? There's the actual experiment. There's a conclusion and all of that. But I, I put it up there because it's a little bit easier than trying to remember back to primary school. <coughs> so I asked that because user experience or user experience design is a science. It's not an art. Design is kind of a misnomer. So as a result, the best way to approach user experience at least for an existing site or product, because creating a new one is a whole different ballgame, is with a method suspiciously similar to the scientific method. And I have to be honest, when I learned about it in school, I didn't think I'd ever look at this stuff again, and now I'm using it every day. So I'm sure my science teacher would be very happy about that. The goal of the scientific method is to identify a cause and, cause and effect relationship that's useful in user experience because you can identify what kind of changes on your site will make your users behave or not behave a certain way. So you can influence the, their behavior in that way. You start by asking a question, identifying a problem, then you cycle through the main research, hypothesis, experiment, and analysis as many times as necessary before drawing your conclusion and making your changes. Then then you're, you're done, I guess. But in order for the scientific method to work, you need to have some requirements met. And this goes in UX. Your results need to be measurable. The point of all of this is to find that cause and effect relationship. So you want to know what works best for your users. Some examples of measurable things on websites are bounce rates or exit rates, conversions, your sales, and a lot of this can be tracked for free through Google Analytics. If you don't have Google Analytics set up on your site, I highly recommend that you do it. Um, it. It doesn't cost you anything, it's really easy, and you get a lot of good information from it. If you have an app or an extension, it's a little bit harder to track things, but you can do it through some usability testing, like tracking how much time it takes a user to complete a task, um, and that sort of thing. So second, you have to be able to construct a fair test. <coughs> a fair test is basically where you change one thing and one thing only. All the other things, all the other variables should remain constant. Because otherwise, if you make a bunch of changes all at once and you do a test and you see some differences, there's no way to really tell which changes were the ones that influence behavior. Or, uh, say you did two changes and they canceled each other out, but if you had done one of them, you would have found a benefit. It's also really good to have a control. 
where you don't change anything so you can see if the results are a fluke or not. And then third, as the Mythbusters always say, it's not science if you don't write it down. You need to keep track of this stuff so that you can reference it later for other um, sites or apps or extensions and uh, use it for future testing or compare it with later results if, if your goals change. So once you're ready to meet all of these requirements, then we can get started. First step was to ask a question or identify a problem. Remember the results need to be measurable and you have to be able to construct a fair test. So, you know, you know the question words, um, some examples of a website, questions that you would ask about a website would be, how do we decrease the bounce rate um, on our homepage from 75%? And bounce rate, if you don't know what that is, it's where someone goes to a website or a page, they don't see what they're looking for, so they immediately hit the back button and they're like, uh, whatever. Uh, exit rates, which I mentioned earlier, where they just completely give up on your site and just exit all of the browser and say, I'm done with this. Other examples of questions would be, what color buttons are um, people more likely to convert on? Or, why aren't people reading the freaking manual? And how do I fix that? There are only a couple examples. Obviously, it's going to depend on your goals and what you're testing. But uh, yeah, it's going to depend on the problems you face. So once you know what you'd like to find out, you have to do some background research. Now, in UX and relating to websites and extensions specifically, you need to focus on your business goals and the user goals. The business goals, I hope, are a little bit easier because you have business goals, right? Um, you, you have a business plan or, or something, a reason that you are looking into user experience. Do you want to increase revenue? Do you want to increase the impressions that you get on your ads? Uh, attract new members to a community or reduce support tickets? All of these goals are going to require a different kind of test or a different strategy when you're moving forward. So if you have multiple goals, you should prioritize them so that you know which ones are more important to you. And again, write it down because it's easy to say in a meeting or whatever, oh yeah, 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 this is what's important. And then two weeks later, someone else goes, wait, I, I thought that we cared about revenue more than more than the support tickets and stuff. And just, just keep track. It's just good practice. But the second part, Finding out your users' goals. It's a little bit trickier, because before you can know their goals, you have to know who they are. You need to know your users. Predictably, knowing who your users are is probably the most important factor in crafting a user's experience. There are some tools that UX professionals use to uh, help solidify uh, their who their business knows as their users. And the biggest one is absolutely personas. The other things, stakeholder interviews, where you interview the people in your company or yourself, if you're a one-man band, um, about who you assume your users are. User interviews, where you actually talk to them, and market research, finding out uh, who your competitors' users are and using their data if you don't have enough. So, Basically, businesses tend to have three to five personas or a different product, an extension. They're fictional characters, or semi-fictional. They're based on real people. And they exist so you can put a face on your research. It's very easy if you're dealing with research and hard numbers to just have all of your users turn into a statistic. But remember that UX is all about feelings and about being empathic and lowering that bar barrier between you and your users. So this, this kind of helps bridge that. Personas answer at minimum what a user's needs are, what their wants, their habits. And they generally tend to be divided by demographics or their goals, motivations, whatever makes sense. Because again, this all depends on who you are as a company. You might be thinking to yourself, oh, I have something like that for marketing. Or I could draw that up in a few minutes. That's not a problem at all. But if you do, that's a fantastic starting point. But you're not done. 
because there's assumptions and then there's reality. And you might think you know who your users are, but if unless you're backing that up with interviews and that sort of thing, talking to your actual customers, you can't really verify who these users are. You could say, well, my audience is uh, females between 25 to 35, and they need this because X, Y, Z. But if you ta talk to your users, you might find out that um, they're teenage boys from like 15 to 18, using it for a completely different reason. And it's useful to know that for business purposes as well, to, to know where your business is going. So take the information that you assu assume you have on your audience and mark things that you have from data, like customer profiles or if people are buying things on your website, you, they fill out a form. And <coughs> just make sure that you delineate that clearly because it's important to know what's, what reality is. So if you don't have that information, the best way, like I said, is to collect it through interviews with the users. You can do surveys, a little pop-up on your site. Um, there are tools that can help you with that. <coughs> with that information, you can then craft the persona's profile. Now I can go into how to do that in detail and talk about it for probably days. It's, a, it's very extensive, but there is a very useful little guide that um, I didn't write. It's, it's on a site called UX Lady because she got the domain before I did. Uh, and she talks about how to create a proper persona and put information in there that's actually useful to you and how to use that information to, to make decisions. And I have a lot more to go through, so I'm cheating and pointing you to her site. Um, but it's, I, I reference that all the time, so it's a very good thing. You don't have to worry about writing everything down, by the way. I will be tweeting out a link. Sorry I didn't say that at the beginning, and, uh, but I'll, I'll be sending out the slides. But check that out when you have a chance. So when you have all of that background information, you need to start. You have to form a hypothesis, and you see that fun little if-then statement which I hated as a kid, but again, I'm using it all the time now. So we're trying to find a cause and effect relationship. If X happens, then Y will happen. For example, if I oversleep, then I will be late. Or if I drink too much, then I will oversleep, and then I will be late. Wait, late. Or if George Wilson commits something, then everything is going to break. <laughs> <coughs> On a more serious note, it helps if you reference the question that you had right at the beginning of all of this to form your hypothesis. One of my examples was what color buttons are people most likely to click on. So then the hypothesis becomes, if buy now is a color that contrasts with the rest of the website, so it stands out more, then people are going to click on it more. And that gives you a good base to test your hypothesis. There are, no, uh, there are a number of different ways that you can do this. Uh, on a website, it's a little bit easier because you can do A-B testing and that sort of thing. It's a little more complicated for a component. Um, but A-B testing basically is where you segment the traffic. Half or whatever percentage goes to a slightly different version. Remember, only one thing should be changing at a time. And then you can compare the data and see what had what effect. <coughs> Depending on your hypothesis or your company, you're going to have to use other methods. But uh, moderated testing is, is what we used at Akiba. Basically, you set a task for users. And you say, OK, I'd, I'd like you to put yourself in this scenario and complete this task. I'm not going to help you but I'll be here for moral support if you need me. And you see what <coughs> happens, and it, uh, it's quite insightful because some of the things that you think are very obvious, then people start having trouble with. And that's the sort of thing that I recommend doing for, for components and extensions. There are services available to help you with any of these things, um, and they can even help you craft the experiment, but it's always possible to do it yourself. 
remember, just quick reminder that the results got to be measurable. You have to be testing something that you can measure. You must be able to have a fair test, and you have to keep track of it, keep records. If you don't meet those requirements, your results probably aren't going to mean a whole lot. So then, you analyze the results. And I can't really go into this step a whole lot because it really depends on what you did, um, what your experiment was, who your users are, but you'll probably have a pretty good idea as you, you're going through this that some things will become self-evident. Um, just seeing what parts people struggle with and what you need to focus on. And I guarantee you learned something. Even if the experiment was a failure, you learned something. So that means we're done, right? That means, that means we went through the scientific method, we did testing, we had results, and we, uh, we implemented it. So we're, we're done, we did UX. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, that's not how it works. Remember that, that little bit right there? Mm. The repeat as necessary? I made it bigger for you. <laughs> it's always necessary because over time your users are going to change. Your business goals might change. New technology comes out and all of a sudden everything's different. And that's the benefit of using a process like this and doing little minor changes at a time because it's always, it's, it's usually very impactful stuff. And you can improve your product gradually over time the other side effect of that is that <coughs> users, and if you've made any big changes in your component or your website all at once, you'll notice users do not like change. They do not agree with it. Even if the new stuff is better, they get really, 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 really mad because they knew how to do the old thing and they had habits set up and muscle memory and all of that. So smaller, gradual changes over time, they help your users adjust to, to better things and uh, you don't need to invest as much in those changes. It's, it's a little bit easier of an incline. So that's all great. That's all a really high level overview of UX as a process and everything. You might already have some ideas, but if you still need to think about, maybe get some inspiration on things that you could test, what are some places that you might be able to check out? Expects practices? Probably not. No. Again, you can you can test it if you think that someone has tested it and it's a it's a site or a product similar to yours or your users are going to be similar. It could be worth a shot. Like I said, it's not it's not too much of a big deal to test one thing, small thing at a time. But in general, to just blindly implement a bunch, it's not a good idea it's not guaranteed to work for your users or your site. Instead, do some user testing. There are some really good resources out there. If you, if you don't know where to start, you can just start with a blank slate and say, okay, this is my product, this is my extension or site, as is right now. What are the things that people are struggling with? User Bob is the least expensive method for testing that I have found. Um, basically, I think it's like a dollar per minute, and you can uh, you can say I want users to look at my site and tell me what they think my site is for, or you can say I want my users to click through and complete a task on my site, and they'll record it for you, and you'll get the recording of people talking through. You'll get the screen share, so people will do it, and that's a really low. Uh, you don't have to do a whole lot in order to run <coughs> testing. UserTesting.com is a little bit more involved and a little bit more of an investment, but it's basically the same idea. It runs, it finds users for you, and it uh, it allows you to see the screen share, the the video of them using your site. Or you can do it yourself. It's really not that difficult. There's an excellent book by Steve Krug called Rocket Surgery Made Easy. Uh, he talks you through how to run a moderated test by yourself, how to set it up and everything, and I highly recommend it. 
he's the same guy that wrote Don't Make Me Think, which is another great resource if you're interested in user experience design. And that'll give you a good starting point. You'll see what people are struggling with. You'll see maybe some opportunities that you can then try and see if it performs a little bit better for you. And in case you were wondering, I know we were talking a lot about personas and everything, and I didn't mention that these had to be your personas. But as Steve, we're totally on first name basis. Uh, as Steve mentions in the book, any person running through your site or component is gonna find probably 80 to 90% of the big major usability problems because they're, they're usually pretty, pretty obvious. Um, and then you can narrow it down from there, and as you do more, you may want to narrow it down to your personas. That's a good way to get um, inspiration. But that's all I have for you right now. I, want I, I need caffeine, so I'm looking for the coffee break. Mm -hmm. But do you guys have any questions before, uh, before I get coffee? Yeah? How do you use Moray in text? I'm sorry? How do you use Moray in text? It's a user. I mean, I've not used it. I mean, I've used that word for uh, screen I haven't used it personally. Uh, when I was doing moderated user testing, I was just using a go-to meeting because I would just, it's a little bit more difficult when it was a component because you can't just point someone to a link. You have to have them be able to log in and everything. So I would give them control of the site. Uh, it probably wasn't the most effective way, so I'd be interested in looking into products like that, but there's a whole lot of um, products out there that you can look into, and if it works for you, that's awesome. Anyone else? I know I kind of went through things a little bit quickly. Yeah. I know you said at the beginning user experience testing is not user interface, but right. it's the user interface which has a direct on the yeah. user experience. So it's the changes in the user interface you're making and then mm -hmm. testing those. Yeah, well, that's a part of it, <coughs> yes. Um, because like I said, user interface is a noun and user experience should more rightly be a user's experience. It's, it's, a, it's more of an action. So user interface is a part of that and it's the easiest thing that we can influence. But there are other things like interaction design, uh, where there's animations or how <coughs> you interact with things that, that can greatly affect it as well. For example, on your phone, if you slide to interact, that's part of the user interface, but it also is taking the interaction <coughs> and the animation and how you're, in how you're working with it into account. There's information architecture, which is how the uh, site content or the component tasks are structured, that is also very important. And you'll hear a lot of people talking about don't have too many clicks, don't have too many layers down, but it, again, it really depends on your users. And I think in the majority of cases, the clicks matter less than uh, a frictionless experience. So if it takes more clicks for someone to get to something, but it's really easy to find what click to make, then it's OK. Um, my mind just completely went blank. There was another couple ones that I wanted to mention, but user interface is a big part of it. Probably the easiest thing to test, but it's a, there's, there's a whole lot more that go into it. And you can, I, I talked about user interface more just because it's a little bit easier to get started on that aspect. Yeah, I mean, uh, user Bob and user testing that I had there, and there's a whole bunch more services out there if you do a Google search um, or a Bing search since we're in the Microsoft building. <laughs> uh, they can allow you to segment or say, I want users with these characteristics or in these age groups. Um, and depending on the tool, a lot of it's mostly by demographics, but you might be able to find tools that have filters by occupation or something. Uh, but worst comes to worst, it's always uh, good to test with your own users. Send out a tweet or a survey, say, hey, I'll give you uh, a discount on the product 
or free version if, you, uh, if you're willing to do some user testing. And that usually works really well because it's people who are actively interested in your product. Yes? I suppose you'd actually class um, the uh, backup support sort of stuff as well. So if you've got problems, you go to a, a support for that company. Mm -hmm. And that's all part of the user interface. I mean, that's not yeah. directly to deal with the actual site of the table. How they actually deal with your problems. It's still part of the user experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you'll find some people referring to that less as user experience and more as customer experience, but it is all related. I mean, any point that you or your product and the users have any kind of interaction, or even before the anticipation of the interaction or after the reaction of the interaction, um, that's a tongue twister. That's all part of it as well. So you could say that providing good customer support, just emailing back politely and um, providing a level of service, that's, that's also part of it because it's, it's linked to you, your business, it's linked to your product and everything. So that's a, that is something I meant to mention. Thank you. Is it like, <coughs> is it like a volume of traffic effect with UX? Most of my sites are quite low volume, mm -hmm. so this seems like a sort of quite an intensive design process to go through to get a, a sort of maybe a lift out in the traffic or interaction. So, <coughs> yeah. is there a break even point? Does it matter where you get a guaranteed reaction? I don't think that you could ever guarantee a reaction because you're dealing with individuals, but. Um, so if my mom were here, she's a sociologist, we could totally go into statistical significance and say, well, unless you have this number of people doing the test, then it's st statistically insignificant and it doesn't matter because you, you can't make reliable predictions if you have a certain, like a, a low number of tests. But we've found, a lot of people, uh, UX professionals have found that like I said, doing tests with a couple people will usually find most of the problems. And it can impact your traffic. If people are going to your site <coughs> and you see that they're immediately clicking off, you're there, you should probably try and figure out why they're doing that. Are they being misled by uh, the Google description and they click on it and they think that your site is something <coughs> that it's absolutely not? Um, or are they going to the right place, but your home page or the site, the page that they landed on, offers no indication that they're meeting their needs? So, a lot of it is meeting, setting the correct expectations for users when they're interacting with your site or when they're about to interact with your site, and meeting them. And honestly, SEO and the keywords that you use and everything that could play a role. UX is big. It's a big field. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Unless, if, if anyone else has questions that uh, well, I didn't get to here, you're welcome to um, contact me. I have my Twitter handle down <coughs> there on the site and everything. So you're welcome to reach out. I'd be happy to answer more, or you can catch me while I'm loading up on caffeine because I'm about to fall over. Uh, but thank you very much for attending and for your interest. It means a lot.